Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Tom's Hardware Podcast for February 15th, 2022. As always, I'm Tom's Hardware Editor Chief Avram Pilch, joined by Associate Editor Les Pounder, Raspberry Pi expert Ash Hill. And we've got two amazing guests here, two towering giants of the of the electronics industry and of the Raspberry Pi community in uh, Lamore, Lady Ada Freed, and Paul Beach from Pimeroni. Uh, this is like having, this is like having like Nvidia make and, a royalty. and AMD on the same call or, a, or AMD and Intel, or it's like, ha, I, although there's, there's not like a rivalry, it's just that you've got like really, uh, you know, towering giants here. So it's just, it's really amazing. And we're all here to uh, take your questions and talk about uh, what Raspberry Pi has uh, meant for uh, meant for their businesses and for the industry uh, with the tenth anniversary coming up. So as always, we're we're taking your questions live. Uh, how are how are you guys doing? Tired. Tired. Yes. Very tired, but okay. Actually. Wide awake. <laughs> yes, because it's. <laughs> It's two thirty in New York where we are, at, yeah. and uh, seven thirty in UK. And Ash, I think you're on the East Coast, so also, also middle of the afternoon, middle of the afternoon for all of you. Uh, what Russell says, Paul, just because you were royalty, you didn't need to stream from your throne in the bathroom. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, no. My That's bathroom doesn't look this good. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I doubt it. So uh, I guess I want to start by asking all of you, starting with, uh, with Lamor, how, um, how did you first get introduced to Raspberry Pi? So actually, you know, the story of Raspberry Pi, I was thinking about um, 10 years ago uh, about Raspberry Pi. And, um, you know, first off, I'd been doing some embedded Linux stuff at the time. So, you know, Raspberry Pi, which is, which is near dear to our heart, was not the first low cost single board Linux computer, uh, which I think is important to note, right? There were, there were a couple beforehand. And I actually had been um, working on um, the Chumby board with Bunny. Uh, so the Chumby board was, you know, Bunny had been using an MX, pro you know, a Freescale MX processor in this, this thing called the Chumby. And um, it was basically a, a Linux computer with a screen. At the time, there was no iPhones. This was kind of an amazing thing. And you could program and run apps on it. And he came out with this board called the Chumby board that was an embedded Linux board that was, I think, also like 40 or 50 bucks. And so, you know, I'd, we'd been experimenting and trying out embedded Linux as a platform for makers, but mostly because at the time, um, you know, Arduino boards had su just started being, uh, coming out with Wi-Fi capabilities. but you know, they were very limited and people really wanted to do more. They wanted to go to a website and get something and, and display it. And it was really, really hard. So it was cool about um, the Raspberry Pi and, and other embedded Linux computers was like, it, it made it really fun and easy to connect to the internet and um, get data and manipulate it and then do something with it. However, what was not missing from most of the embedded Linux boards at the time, a lot of them were open WRT hacked boards. Like people would take routers and they'd open up the router and they would re reflash it with, um, you know, there were a bunch of distributions, but they didn't have GPIO available. And so what was cool about um, the Chumby board and then the Raspberry Pi was it had this GPIO, which made it really fun. I think that's actually like the fun part of the Raspberry Pi is that it was easy to connect external hardware and then have it interface with um, the Linux running on board too had this very powerful core and then this like crispy chocolatey outside, which was kind of delicious. And so I remember specifically when I got like the first Raspberry Pi and I was like, I think I was getting an accelerometer and maybe I was getting some data from the internet and blinking some LEDs. Uh, like I put made it, I, like I pressed a button and it sent some email or something. And I turned to Phil and I was like, ah, this is really fun. Yeah, this is actually fun, um, which is a big deal for me because if something is fun, um, that means it, it's successful. It, it's it's risen beyond that technological hurdle of complexity um, and, and made it past the point where you can actually enjoy using it. So that was my long-winded story about um, when I first used the Raspberry Pi and I remember being at the kitchen table and I turned to him and I said, wow, that was really fun. 
Yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's experience a lot of people have. How about, how about you, Paul? You made, you designed the logo. Uh, yeah, so for years we've been kind of playing around with mini ITX boards, and there was the kind of gumsticks PCs, and the BeagleBone was the the Beagle board, and then the Beagle Bone were the first ones to kind of dip below one hundred dollars, and that was really kind of big at the time. But then Raspberry Pi came along with this big claim of twenty five dollars, and there was something about it that said they that they were actually going to do it rather than it being vapor. And kind of stole all the thunder, and yeah, Eben, Eben and Liz came through. That was the thing; uh, they they made it happen, and that was the big difference. And it just it just set everything on fire, and everyone had to scramble to make cheaper and cheaper stuff. So it was just kind of for me as a geek at the time, it was it was a breakthrough. It just made everything cheaper. Yeah, no, no question. So Les, you had a question. Yeah, I'm interested to hear how you both started the businesses because we sort of take you for granted now. We can just go onto the shop and buy something, and then a few days later, it's in our hand. You know, like us geeks just love his brain candy. So I want to know how it all started for you both, and Lamar, if you want to go first. Yeah, sure. Ooh, I'm big. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Adafruit's actually, you know, we started in 2005, so you know, been around for for quite a bit at this time. Um, and, you know, we started with uh, DIY kits. Um, you know, again, there, w there was embedded Linux at the time, but it was like PC 104 boards and, yeah, gum sticks. Like, it was not very affordable and people didn't really use it. Um, but we'd been doing um, stuff with microcontrollers and then Arduino came about. And so we'd mm -hmm. been doing Arduino accessories. And what was really neat is, um, you know, the idea of you have this main board and then you plug in accessories into it was sort of like well established by Arduino. And to be honest, before then it wasn't really a thing. Um, there were like, sometimes you'd have like a, like a basic stamp and you'd plug it into something. But the idea of having like a main board and these accessory shields that mm -hmm. plugged or even stacked, like I remember that this was a big deal that people were like, wow, you can stack stuff onto it to add capabilities. And you know, PC 104 had done this, but it was, um very industrial and it wasn't part of the maker community and it wasn't um it wasn't it wasn't really an open standard to the same way um and yeah. so having come from doing arduino accessory boards like the arduino came out also around 2005 and so even though our first products at adafruit were not arduino accessories we kind of quickly started developing stuff for arduino mm -hmm. um then when raspberry pi came about i was like oh this is really familiar and i knew what worked like I knew that the Arduino system worked. And so this could be like a way to expand upon that um, and take the kind of products that we'd been designing and, and you know, design other products for the Raspberry Pi. And, you know, we still have a couple kits, but we're very quickly moving towards a lot of our stuff right now is very plug and play, like less soldering because there's a lot of schools that don't have soldering irons. There's people who yeah. may not have the dexterity to solder. Um, so it is, you know, it's, it's super fun. We still have, we still sell Minty Boost kits, like product number 14 is still available in the shop. <laughs> um, but uh, for the most part, a lot of people at this point, again, they want to move to that higher level of you're using Linux and you have that power. And then you have the fun of like little glowy doodads that you plug into it. Awesome. Paul, how about you? So for us, me and John, we've been doing kind of business startups for a few years and just kind of hacking around with stuff. We read Hacker News. We were all in with that. And we'd done some stuff. We'd done web agencies, design stuff. And that was okay. Then we got into making quadcopters and then Raspberry Pi came along and I was kind of palling around with them because I did the logo. And I got a case from Adafruit that was kind of the lace cut one that was six sides. And I got it. And it just rattled a bit much. And for some reason, that irked me. So then I went away and badgered my local hack space to borrow their laser cutter and teach me how to laser cut. And from that, I designed the Pivo and learned how to do 2.5D design because that's all I was capable of in Illustrator. And that was our first product. And I spent months kind of refining it and putting barriers up and saying, oh, John, we'll, we'll launch it after we've done this, this, and this. And eventually John just said, no, we're launching it. We put it up, rushed behind, tweeted about it, and did a did a blog post, and we were off. That was the start of Pimeroni. Brilliant. 
Wow. Yeah. I have a question for the both of you, and I imagine it's it's kind of a broad question, so feel free to dig into either community aspects or whatever, but I want to know, I guess I'll start with a little more. Uh, how has the Raspberry Pi changed the way you and your team approach board development in general? Um, how do I change how I do board? Well, first off, I think, you know, while we talk about the Raspberry Pi computer, I think the RP2040 chip, which just came out, was, was like really perfect timing um, because it came out when there is a real dearth of um, microcontrollers available. And another thing that is, um, the, the, I want to mention about the Raspberry Pi that's interesting is, is the Pi in Raspberry Pi is for Python. Even though it's spelled PI, it's actually like PY for Python. And when Raspberry Pi sort of um, settled on Python as like the programming language they wanted to use, it actually helped cement our decision to use develop and, and use CircuitPython for our boards and go towards more um, uh, embedded Python interpreters rather than like C compiled code. Because before then, again, it's like for the, the BeagleBone and for the, uh, I even ha I was actually looking, I still have like the, the first few code examples that I wrote for uh, the Chumby board, it was all in C. And um, moving towards interpreted design does mean that our boards have to have more like flash and RAM because they're interpreted, but the usability is, is much better. Like I'm kind of willing to sacrifice cost and RAM and flash in order to make things easier for people to use. And also I'm trying to make, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to do recently is make sure that whatever we design, it works equivalently um, on a Raspberry Pi as a microcontroller. Now Raspberry Pi is not a microcontroller, it's a microcomputer. But for a lot of people, if you like keep telling them that, it's like nobody cares. Like <laughs> everyone knows it's Frankenstein's monster, but we're gonna call him Frankenstein. Like we, like we know and we don't care. And so sort of just like letting go of that and saying, okay, look, you know, embedded, Linux and microcontrollers are pretty much the same thing. And honestly, a lot of microcontrollers are starting to come up onto 500, 600 megahertz anyway. So it's like they're, you know, they're starting to really merge together. And what does that mean for usability? And what does that mean for um, increasing the number of people who can do electronics? I think Raspberry Pi has pushed me to acknowledge that they're, you know, I'm not just making stuff for experts and PhD students and, and people who've been in industry. I have to make products and tutorials and uh, projects for like this really wide group of people, a lot of whom are like beginners. This is like their first project. They just bought a Raspberry Pi. They heard they can do something with it. And what do they do? And I and I can't come at them and say, okay, well, first off, you have to compile this Linux kernel. You know, I have to make it as easy as possible. Um, so usability is a really big thing that I've learned from Raspberry Pi and accessibility. Paul, how about you? So what was the question again? It was a big question, wasn't it? Because really, we started off kind of in in the in the kind of wake of Raspberry Pi. So it started off with the cases, then we did the Pi Cade, which was um, that was still you know Raspberry Pi laser cutting, and from there is actually kind of Adafruit with their trailblazing. We use them as a model. It's like if Adafruit have done it, it's got to be a good idea. So from that, we got the pick and place machine and started designing circuit boards. And at the time, it was just the 26-pin header. And we did some stuff with that, but it, it didn't really take off until kind of Evan said, right, we're going to have the hat format. We're going to put constraints on what you should do with an add-on board. And that changed everything. That suddenly gave us something to butt against. And from that, we just kind of started releasing a lot of boards. Um, so the hat format was big for us. And then we went really big for the RP2040 because we'd been waiting years for Raspberry Pi to make that move. You mm -hmm. know, they, by making the small board computers, they put pressure on kind of Intel, Asus, basically everybody in the industry. And yeah, we want them to do the same with the microcontrollers. We want them to put the cold wind up them so it gets better for consumers, gets better for companies like us to have microcontrollers around. And it's been a blinder. It was perfect timing. Ava, we can't hear you. Sorry, trying to make sure no one can hear the toddler. Um, <laughs> the, uh, we have a we have a question here from a reader from a viewer. I'm not sure we can answer, but why are all GPIO pins on the Pi Digital while Arduino always had a few analog pins? 
Yeah, that's that's you know that's one of the things that is is a design decision and constraint. Um, not all single board Linux computers um, don't have analog digital converters, but they often don't. It's pretty rare, and the chip that's used in the Raspberry Pi wasn't really designed for general purpose computing. Uh, for what I call the original, it was designed as a coprocessor for for mobile phones. Um, so it doesn't have analog inputs, which is is a constraint that we've had to work with. Um, you know. The Arduino is based on microcontrollers, and and one of the nice things about microcontrollers is they they're kind of a little bit of a bento box, right? You get a little bit of everything. You know, you don't have it's not running at uh, 700 megahertz. It's not a gigantic ass stake, but it does have like an analog digital, and sometimes a DAC, and sometimes it has PWM outputs, which also the Raspberry Pi doesn't have. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes has five volt compatible inputs. Um, so, it, you know, there is a little bit of overlap in that Venn diagram of what a Raspberry Pi can do and, and a microcontroller Arduino can do. Um, that said, there's microcontrollers that don't have analog digital converters either. I think the propeller doesn't, um, a couple other chips don't. So, uh, you know, it's it's interesting. One of the things we've done with, with Blinka, which is our compatibility layer for CircuitPython and Python, is this realization that, you know, as Raspberry Pi came up, um, you know, I like to call it the, um, like the street sharksification of electronics. It's like TG Ninja Turtles became like this really gigantic big brand. And suddenly like every animation studio is like, well, we need some sort of amphibian fighting thing. And so there's like all these weird like knockoff shows like like Street Sharks and there's like Battletoads. And it's like, they're, it's not quite Ninja Turtles, but it's like, I guess they're green and they fight crime. So, you know, you've got this like massive, you know, hundred different all winner boards available, which I think is actually really cool. I think that, that all, all winner and other and like rock pie and whatever have sort of pushed into um, mm -hmm. single board computing because Raspberry Pi kind of came at them and, and proved the market. Um, but some of them do have analog digital inputs. Some have like the Coral board has ADCs and PWMs. Um, so trying to have a compatibility layer that makes it work with all of these uh, this gigantic ecosystem of, of single board computers is, is, is worked out, but it's, it's kind of fascinating to see um, how the rest of the market has responded to Raspberry Pi and, and come about it. But yeah, not, you know, Raspberry Pi can do some things very well, and there's some things that an Arduino can do really well, and there's, there's a little bit of overlap in the middle, but there are still many things that, um, there's people who say, I want to do this project on Raspberry Pi, and I'm like, ah, you know, you're not going to have a good time. You really want to use a microcontroller for that. Yeah, very, very true. Also, you can always buy uh, Adaf both Adafruit and Pimeroni have some really wonderful hats that will add a ADC capability to your Raspberry Pi. So, uh, so we wanted to ask, uh, does the community, how has the community influenced your product decisions? Uh, Lamore, is there uh, any, are there a lot of things that you've made because you saw community feedback? Um, you know, definitely seeing uh, projects that people um, have built have sort of been like, okay, here's what people want to do with it. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's a couple common projects that I've seen show up a bunch, um, like people making like arcade cabinet type projects or retro emulation projects or um, ad blocking stuff. So we'll try to put together project packs for that. Um, but I think you know, one thing I'll say is you can't, you have to listen to the community, but you also, if you listen to the community, you just get um, like a faster horse, right? You don't get a car. Uh, and so what, you know, thinking about what would be cool and inventing stuff that I think is neat and the people on the Adafruit team think is neat. And then we put it out there and we just see, you know, whether people react to it. Because again, like you don't, it's, it's not, people don't always know what they want. And sometimes the things that they want are constrained by by what's out there already. Um, mm -hmm. So I have to kind of go with my gut, which is I look at something and if I personally think it's kind of cool, um, I'll design it or if I think it would be useful. Um, you know, it's also, there's, there's a lot of market where people, they're not in the community yet and they would be in the community if they had projects and hardware to make what they're doing work out. You know what I mean? So you have to kind of reach beyond um, and bring new people in. And that's kind of what design's about, right? Is, is, to, is to not just go down a checklist, um, but to think creatively. Yeah, I, I think about your, uh, your KB2040 and other efforts to bring like mechanical keyboard design 
as something where Adafruit has gotten into kind of a new space and probably brought in a, a whole bunch of people who weren't necessarily using microcontrollers before. Yeah, and that was just based, that was because of a decision that Adafruit had made four or five years ago to have an open USB stack, right? Like it's it's a little bit like that little domino gif where it's like you little domino and it like, like this gigantic domino at the end, it's like 150 pounds. So because we had worked on Teeny USB, which is an open USB core stack, that stack ended up being our core base for CircuitPython was adapted by the Raspberry Pi team for the RP2040, which made it possible for us to do HID uh, keyboards very easily in CircuitPython with the RP2040. And and I know Pimeroni's also done a ton of experiments with keyboards, including um, native keyboards, like native HID support in the Raspberry Pi, which is astonishing to me. Um, I'm, I'm quite impressed that you guys got that to work. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're still not sure. That, that was a... Yeah, the whole original Kibo was just uh, a beautiful mistake. I, I <laughs> made the kind of so white much. hat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of stuff there that we never used again, but we learned a lot from it. We put it out there so people could kind of tear it apart. And yeah, it's good stuff. And it was, it was passion stuff. So yeah, the question was kind of what does the community inform? And they give us a lot, a lot of ideas. They give us a lot of feedback. We're very opinionated about what we do because I think the thing me and John did from the start was bringing what we know, graphic design and product design, and bringing it into green circuit boards. And this doesn't apply to Adafruit because Adafruit have always done things differently and, you know, they're good at design. But there was a lot of green add-on boards that were just not right and we didn't feel it spoke to a lot of people. Um, but we also, we suffered because we didn't use our products in anger enough the way the community used them. And we're getting better at that now. Chris on his robot stuff, he uses them in anger. He asked the community to test them out before we release them. And we're getting better at that now, having products that match what people want to do with them a little bit better. And we've always not been as good as that as we should be. I, I think one thing that's really cool that you know you have both of us on here is that... Um, because yeah, I remember when we started out, like nobody was watching, but you're like, oh, you guys are like, you know, competitors. And we're like, not really. We're actually both like skateboarders at the skate park. And <laughs> like, I do a trick and then you guys are looking, you're like, mm, that's interesting. Like, okay, I'm going to do like a trick, but I'm going to put like a twist on it. And so there, I see that, you know, in the, the market, in the community, Raspberry Pi and Arduino, there's a lot of back and forth. And like, I think outsiders could be like, oh, you're like competitive, but it's like, no, it's like we're learning from each other and building on each other. Like, you know, the, the circuit boards that we make for sensors now have this like quick STEM IQT connector. And I totally yeah. barred that looking at Sparkfun. I'm like, you guys did a really good job with that. That was really smart. I'm going to take that and adapt it. And I saw like the Kibo from um, Raspberry Pi and other, not uh, Primarily, sorry. I know the difference between yeah. the two. It's like four children, they're all different names. Um, and I saw that and I was like, oh, that's such a good idea. Like LEDs under keyboard, you know, keyboard switches and they're clear and they're glowy. But I was like, well, you know, I like that, but I don't, you know, I want to use this RP2040 and I want a macro pad and I want a rotary encoder because like rotary encoders are so cool. Mm -hmm. And that's how we designed the macro pad. Um, but you know, we like went really hardcore on the silk screen because we're like, well, we gotta like show that you yeah. know we are our silk screen is just as cool as as you know Pimerani <laughs> silk screen. So that's, <laughs> so that's like you know like my hardware design inspires others, and then I get inspired by like Pimerani design. Yeah, it's like the macro pad. So like we went like really hardcore on that. We'd done like really cool silk screens, but we hadn't like pushed it to the next level. And I wanted to to do that. Um, part of that is again, it's like. If I'm going to, you know, it's like if you're gonna if you're gonna compete, if I'm gonna look at the skateboarding tricks that Primaroni does, I have to and and say like, hey, watch this. I better do something really good. Like I don't want to embarrass myself. Right? <laughs> I gotta do a really good fucking trick so that um, I show like this is how I honoring your contribution by showing what I've learned, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, me too stuff, you know, it's, it's not the same. We don't, copy pasta doesn't work. You've got to have your own spin on it. You've got to say, no, it should have been done this way, but also this way, as well as your way. You know, it's good. It's collaborative and it totally works because, you know, most of the time it's not rocket science what we're doing. It's about choices and about presentation and it's about explaining why we're doing things and why they're cool. Um, so, yeah. And we, we just wouldn't be here were it not for, I think, Raspberry Pi and Adafruit are two of the biggest legs and the reason why we're here. Without you, we wouldn't be here. 
at all. Simple as that. Yeah, I love I love the open community and like you know everything we do is open source too. We just like hit 500 open source boards and and you know I know that Raspberry Pi isn't open source, but I think that a lot of the community does share with each other, which I really like. I mean, like you don't know how special this is until you look at other communities where it's like, oh, to log into the forums, you have to like type in a code that you got when you ordered the product. Like it's like, it can, it can get like really messed up and weird and very constrained. And like, if you look at this now, it's like copyright and you can't use it. And da -da. whereas I feel like Raspberry Pi yeah. has a really good ecosystem of like, you know, you credit and you grow with others. Um, even for people who yeah. aren't doing open source, I feel like it at least has that feeling of, of a community working together um, and learning from yep. each other. And and also contributing back, like like you know, Pi you guys take care of the WS twenty eight one X Python library. That's not my problem. Thanks for doing that. We use it. But like that's one thing that you did, right? Whereas like I take care of some other Linux kernel stuff. Like and we we all share and and, and use the code together, um, understanding that to get like individually we can't do it and it also doesn't make sense to have like sixteen competing WS twenty eight one X libraries for low level Raspberry Pi interfacing. It's like you'd want to just kill yourself. <laughs> yep. No doubt. Les, you have a question. I do, but I've noticed a comment that's come up as well, which makes me feel incredibly old. So thank you very much, Martin Cole. Uh, I built a GERT board shortly after getting my original Pi. It had digital to analog and analog to digital mode controller and even an Arduino chip. And I remember the GERT board. I that don't was, remember I that. Think, it's old. It was Gert Van yeah. Loos. That was like the, one of the first designs, and I was a little yeah. Like I don't know about how you know Paul felt about it, but I looked at it and I'm just like, I could do better. I could do a really good job. It's a board <laughs> only, only your a, mother could love. I could do it. I could do yeah. a good job, and I think that's good. Right? In, inspires me. Inspired me to come out with a bunch of different designs for Adam boards. Although nothing quite the same as the Gert board. I try not to like make something equivalent. I always try to make something that's like parallel or similar to try you know again to to see what might be successful in the market you'd be surprised sometimes i'm like really that's what people want but yeah it's what people want yeah well it leads me on to the question actually which is fantastic so far thank you martin you've just done a great segue for me questions both here what is your most well your most proudest product if you could only choose one thing from your entire catalog it could be pi arduino circuit python whatever just one thing what are you proud of and that's to Lamar, first of all, I think. Why do I have to go first? Lady <laughs> Kate is first. Ah, uh, yeah, I get ladies first. Uh, the queen. I think, yeah, the queen. Yeah. Uh, I, I really do think that the, the Blink and Circuit Python work we've done has been um, really, really good. And it's been a really big push for the couple of years. And um, we made a lot of decisions which were really tough. But mm -hmm. I know for a fact it's working because. Um, you know, we have so many people who contribute new board definitions. We have so much code that we see working, you know, across different platforms. And, you know, I hate to say like, oh, it's a new standard, but we've, we, I think we've really made it easy, easier for people to develop hardware and to interface with hardware. Um, you know, adding plug and play instead of soldering stuff. The, the usability I think is, is a, is a big leap forward. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I, I gauge that by looking at the support questions and we don't get support questions about soldering as much anymore or um, really basic stuff. I think Raspberry Pi has done a really good job with their tutorials. Um, so we can send people to the Raspberry Pi tutorial system and be like, look, go install Raspberry Pi OS. They've made it really easy. Follow these three guides, then come back here and, and continue. Um, and that's worked out. And like we've all really built on each other with with really good guides and documentation so that people can actually achieve their projects instead of like struggling with compiling Linux kernels or like editing Etsy conf files, like we're, I, th I think we've moved past that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would just have to jump in and say that Adafruit's tutorials are like the best I've ever seen. It's yeah. just such an incredible, incredible resource. I mean, I just, you know, when I, as a writer and an editor, read, look at your tutorials, how they're laid out, how they're written, just how you guys have, I don't know, I guess built whatever, built your design. And the thing is, I don't think you guys remember what it was like before. Like, actually, I don't, want to get, I don't write a lot of the guides, but like, it was really, really bad. Like, electronic kits and tutorials were like, like you guys would, like, nobody would put up with it if it was, it was like, 
all text. It was basically like a how-to Linux file. It was all text. There was no images. There was no screenshots. Mm -hmm. Like you'd get to halfway through and then something would be different. And then you'd be like, do I continue? Do I stop? Where am I? I don't know. You know, there was no facts. There was no troubleshooting. There was like nothing, nothing. So it was really, really hard to, like, you, you know, you could get to the golden path, but it was like, if anything varied, um, you were really screwed. So I, I think that, um, thankfully all all tutorials have gotten like infinitely better and like i'm so glad when i google stuff i'm not the only link anymore like thank you other people for writing, like, <laughs> libraries and code i i go to them and i like see what they say great paul what's the product that uh, you're most proud of at pomeroni i think it's got to be pycade in the end it's it's the one i just like the look of it the feel of it how good the kits are these days it's just cute um yeah, we, we made a nice thing that's not quite like anything else. Uh, I think it's much less community like oriented. But <laughs> yeah, yeah I have one. It's cool. Yeah, yeah no, no, no yep. question about it. That is a, a great product. All right, we have time for one more question, and that goes to Ash. Okay, so we've been looking back at the past 10 years of the Raspberry Pi, and we have a lot of experience put together collectively on this podcast with the Raspberry Pi. So I want to look forward as cheesy as this is kind of going. I want to know, both of you, I guess I'll start with a little more again, what do you guys want to see out of future iterations of the Raspberry Pi? And that could be full-size SBCs, microcontrollers, or any other kind of board that might not exist yet. Um, well, I do, I do want a next-gen RP2040 with an M4 processor um, because I love the M4 or an M7. I would I really love that. Um, for the Raspberry Pi itself, actually, I did have notes. One thing I will give credit to Raspberry Pi a lot for, they listen to user feedback a lot. Um, I remember the first Raspberry Pi came out and they're like, what could we do? And I was like, could you please add mounting holes? And they're like, oh, okay. And the next generation came out and had mounting holes. And I was like, oh my God, thank you so much. You know, so so they do listen to feedback. Um, I think that the current Raspberry Pi, the Pi 4 is really a, a very mature product. Um, I would, what would I like to see on it? Um, I would really love to be able to get to the console from uh, the USB onboard uh, USB-C port, that would be really sweet. Um, it's like, I know you would have to do some things to do that, but it would be uh, super cool. I understand that for pricing reasons, it's not there. And I know it's a weird, weird thing, but um, an on-off switch, you know, mm. I, I studied under um, John Mida at the Media Lab and, um, you know, he had a lot of really interesting ideas, but one, I, one thing that he did tell me was, a sign of product maturity is an on-off switch. And I was like, ooh. Like, he's like a project, mm -hmm. you know, because we, we did prototypes at the Media Lab, and he's like, when there's an on-off switch, that's when you know it's really moved up to the next level. Um, so I think I think that would be cool. I don't think it's ever going to happen, but it's like if we're, if we're putting about wishes and dreams, you know, why not just throw it out there? I like that one. That is a critical component I would be happy to see, too. It would free yes. up some GPIO. <laughs> We have yeah. asked Evan Upton about that a bunch of times, and I think, I think he said, people wouldn't, uh, not enough people would use it to justify the cost. Or yeah, we did. We did add a current. We we wrote a long, long time ago a little kernel module that would use a GPIO pin to do a soft reset. You know, it was a power pin, but it would do like a shutdown and start up. Um, and then you know we stopped doing kernel mods because it just we couldn't keep up with with the the rapid iterations. Um, yeah, I still kind of having an onboard button but it's uh i agree it's it's challenging you have to teach people how to use it and it's not um that's not easy but otherwise i think the raspberry pi really's got uh there's really you know it's like it's like you can't add analog inputs because there's no analog pwm outputs because the chip just doesn't support it so that's that's that so i'm not i'm not gonna ask for things that i know are are not within the realm great how about you paul i think rp2040 with like a smaller one and a bigger one yeah one that's smaller and can do do really low power would be good. That'd be yeah, we'd like that because it's just it's it's a beautiful jelly bean part, and it can only go it can only get better. It's you can use it for everything. It's OP for most stuff. Uh, as far as the SBC, I think it's just keep hacking the market, keep the market honest, keep it cheap. Uh, the little socialist inside me really likes what it does for people buying computers and using computers. Mm. Yeah, no, no question about it. Well, I want to thank our our, spe our very special guests, uh, Lamore Lady Out of Freed and Paul Beach from Pimeroni. Thank you guys so much. It's been such an honor, uh, as always. And thanks to all of you for watching and listening. 
we are here every Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. UK time, 2.30 p.m. Eastern, and we will see you all next week. Thanks, everyone.